Okay, so there is really just no good time to do this, so I'm just going to do it. Uh, I had generated this talk uh, <clears throat> for a local tech conference that we were doing uh, last year. They didn't have enough time for both of them, so at a vote, uh, people chose the next generation of keyboards. So that was fine. The talk went well. Uh, everyone seemed to like it. It was voted best talk of that day, which is kind of weird. Uh, but this one I didn't get to do. And I just spent a bit of time on it, and people have been asking me about Emacs versus Vim and, and my Switch. Uh, and, you know, they kind of want to get into it too. They want to know more details. So this is my kind of short talk on it. Um, Emacs versus Vim? Why can't we all just get along? <laughs> All right, so the beginning has uh, some intro to me. Uh, you can probably skip ahead. I'll put a link in the description for where to skip ahead if you don't want to hear about me, uh, because who wants to hear about me? Who am I? Uh, this is the only section where I actually read this stuff. I am, in reverse, in reverse order of importance, an autodidact programmer, a freelance full-stack developer, ergonomic keyboard designer, pen tester, hardware hacker, workflow zealot. That's important. Firearms instructor, father, father and follower of Jesus. <coughs> Why am I doing this talk? I am also a sufferer of typing-related repetitive stress injury. In a couple of decades of computing, I've typed very fast and very much. My top speed is 130, I mean 133 technically, but day-to-day <laughs> but -day I'm usually around a 100. Um, this is one of those things you should remember. It's not really about typing speed. When you get into these powerful editors, you should be typing as little as possible. Uh, uh, but I'm usually around 100. A few years ago, I started getting hand pains. Um, so from that point, I started developing more comfortable keyboard. Uh, this is, I'm using this one right now. Pretty sure that's in frame. Uh, it's a Signum 3.1. Um, with two primary objectives in mind, this is a, a nice formula. I haven't seen anywhere else, uh, but I'm pretty sure uh, it is something that I came up with somehow. Uh, move less and type less over less time. So seriously, why? I don't know why this is in here. Wh what does this have to do with Emacs and Vim? Well, your text editors, these both of these text editors are very customizable. Um, uh, Emacs even goes so far as to say it's the first I immediate response. I forget what it says. It's the first bit of software that's immediately responsive to your keystrokes. This is in the days of terminals, where you type stuff and it goes off to a computer, and the computer processes it and then sends data back to you. In Emacs, you are processing things directly. You have what is essentially an operating system, and that that old that Vimmer joke of uh, Emacs is a great operating system lacking only a good text editor is actually rather quite accurate, <laughs> which you'll you'll find as as we move on. So, um, right. Uh, so you these tools, both of these tools are made to be customized to your workflow. Your workflow. Not my workflow, not other people's workflow. These should be viewed as, uh, as machining tools that you use to machine tools that make machining more tools easier. So the, the tool should be helping you make more tools. Uh, when you build a lathe that isn't that good, you use that all right lathe to make a better lathe. And you keep doing that and improving your tools and you get more precise over time. Kill your mouse. This is a, uh, this is a, uh, just a, an ergonomic note. Um, it's also worth noting that while well, both of these text editors avoid the mouse entirely, uh, well, not entirely, but pretty much. Everyone is different, but most mice are bad for ergonomics. There's absolutely nothing um, nice or good about repeatedly, this repeated motion. It, it's not good. The lighter this motion is, the better, technically, but for the most part, just skip it if you can. Uh, it's, it's not good. Uh, there are many motions involved in operating the keyboard. You're moving your hands around. You're, you're moving things around. You're, and there's pretty much one for the mouse. You're pretty much doing this. And you're repeating it thousands of times every month. Just mouse less if you can. Uh, so these editors will also help you to do that. Um, this also means you spend less time reaching for your mouse, less time pressing the same keys uh, f over, uh, you know, the total of less time during the day. So I hope that makes sense. Where are we? What did I do? Okay. So 
if you put all those things together, you probably notice this seems like it helps you get more work done and give you more free time to work on other things and work and have family time. And you're right, time is your most valuable resource. Don't spend it doing something your text editor or keyboard can do for you. Remember that. Remember that. Um, there's a, this is a little off topic, but when, when we start working, we feel like this work thing is a thing that's separate from us and that our play and that our hobby is something that's separate from work. If we uh, combine or at least do a Venn diagram, a little bit of overlap of those things, you wind up putting a lot more, you get a lot more enjoyment out of your work. Um, and that means that you also do things like improve your work, improve your abilities. I, I really think people can, I think most people can touch type, this is really off topic. I think most people can touch type, but they just don't try because that's like a work thing. I don't wanna do work. But when you do those things and when you improve those things, uh, like when you improve your keyboard and you build macros and you build automation for yourself and you build tools to help you do more work faster, you feel better about the work. You feel good about what you accomplish at the end of the day. And overall, your life, you know, it still takes you less time to do it. It's, it's definitely, it's the way to go. It's, it's what people should be doing. It's, I don't know, there's some kind of mental block for people who want to improve their workflow. So don't be one of those people who... <laughs> who thinks that work is just work. <sighs> Obligatory warning, no pitchforks, no torches. Uh, obviously this is a, um, Emacs versus BIM is a big deal. Uh, if you know anything about the history of <laughs> the internet, I guess it's, you know, there's two camps for it and uh, it's, it becomes very polarized very quickly. So no pitchforks, no torches. Uh, I'm not trying to be controversial, but I just find myself in this unique position. Uh, I was a heavy Vimmer and um, I transitioned to Emacs, uh, I guess last year, and it's been uh, it's been quite a ride. It was a very difficult transition uh, because there's a, a lot to change. Um, <laughs> this is just like my opinion, man, which is quite true. Uh, and I know more about Vim than Emacs, and I choose Emacs. This section, <laughs> please don't tell me how I was wrong for one specific use case. Please do tell me when I'm wrong because I just didn't know about cool software that actually handles that issue. That's very important and uh, something that like, you need to, what did I just do? There we go. See, this is what I'm talking about. This is expanding weird, hello, that was very strange. This is Emacs, right? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> best thing about Vim and Emacs are their age. People have been improving them for decades and it's simply impossible to know all of the possibilities. Uh, just skimming through Vim's help file will always reveal something useful that you probably didn't even know about and was developed before you were born. Um, that's, uh, that's extremely true of both bits of software. It's, it's, it's incredible. Um, a lot of Vim plugins are things that are handled in vanilla Vim. And there's a, there's a video called uh, How to Do Most in Vim with uh, Most with Vanilla Vim or something like that. Uh, replicate plugins with Vanilla Vim. Um, but that's beside the point. Okay, so Vim. Features of Vim. Exiting. This is important. <laughs> uh, press Escape colon, Q, and then press enter. Uh, alternatively, you can press escape and then capital Z, capital Q. That'll get you out of Vim. It's very important. Uh, but the main feature of Vim is its modality. And I think people have problems with that for some reason. I don't, I don't understand why, but basically, if you're opening a, a notepad, you're basically in input mode. Everything you type, goes into the text buffer of the screen of the thing that you're typing into, the file that you're typing into. And when you press arrows, it moves the cursor around, which will change the point at which you do stuff in that file. Normal mode. Normal mode is the function mode. It's where every key on this keyboard is a function. Every key does a thing. Uh, so you think about uh, if you go grab your mouse, which you shouldn't do, and click on file, and it has all those options in there. You get to do that, but with 
every key on your keyboard. So just think about that. Think about uh, completely eliminating any form of menu navigation. Just gone, okay? Um, leader key, the leader key is an extension of function mode. Uh, remember how I said you would have every key on your keyboard is a function? Well, if you use the leader key, which I highly recommend you do, um, when you press that leader key, every key on your keyboard becomes another function. So, and that's, uh, that's recursive too. You can hit leader key twice and then have every key on the keyboard do another function. So you have these like layers, you can just build on these functions forever. And these functions that you might not even use that often, you can hide away in, a, in some corner with, you know, leader key, leader key, Q will do that thing. And it's fun that you don't have to think about that. You know, you can make them do all these things and package it as a function and then just fire it easy. Uh, there's a visual mode. Visual mode is selection mode. It's essentially dragging the mouse. It's selecting things. Uh, that's it. You, you get a visual feedback of what it is that you're selecting. Now, note that visual mode is a visual selection mode, but it is uh, almost entirely unnecessary because you can do pretty much every bit of selection in Vim without using a visual selection. So visual selection is mainly just to help the human operating Vim. Uh, command mode is superpower mode. Uh, it kicks off a separate thread, as far as I can tell, that runs a very short instance of Vim that executes a command. So instead of it running on your, your system and updating back and forth and waiting for input, um, it's almost like kicking off a background process. This command mode will let you do regular expressions super easy and extremely fast. And it's, it's that, that's right here. That, this is the, the main feature, is super speed. Uh, super speed gets you, where am I? There we go. Why am I in S? I'm flubbing keys here. I'm just, I'm fl flustered. <laughs> super speed, uh, super speed is the main appeal of Vim. Um, the speed that you get, it's addicting. Uh, you get to edit text almost as fast as you think. Uh, anything that gets between you thinking I want to do X and then that being done on your screen, anything that gets between you and doing that is travel time. Anything that gets between that is unnecessary. And in Vim, since all these functions are right on your keys, you pretty much type those functions, you pretty much, uh, once you learn the grammar, the grammar, you type that stuff as you think it. And you get this, this uh, almost magic text editing. Uh, and if other people see you text editing in Vim, they will think that you are doing magic <laughs> because it is, so, it is so very different from most text editing with other editors. So if you're messing around with Vim or you want to be introduced to Vim or you want to try out Vim, don't stop until you get that, that feel for the speed uh, because it's... That was the main. That was the, the main feature for me, uh, and obviously, you know, as I said above, more speed means more work done faster over less time, uh, and Vim very much supports fewer keystrokes while doing all that. So Vim has grammar. Uh, grim, grim. <laughs> Vim is almost. It's almost a. Uh, it's almost a, a short language. Uh, you're using. You're using. Uh, you know, keystrokes to move things around. Now these are these are essentially arrow keys that I'm using right here. I'm just moving the cursor up and down and left and right. Now if I want to use uh, a motion, um, I, I can't say, okay, let's say an object. So object, a, a, a word object. I hit W. It skips ahead to the end of this word. I hit W again. It skips to the next word. I do capital W. It skips to the next word, skipping over these punctuation marks. I can move this cursor around very easily to different parts of this text wherever I want without touching the mouse. So, and then numbers, you can build, it's almost like you're scripting with Vim live. And there's always some weird idea that you have for like, but what if I make a motion that moves up to here 
and I want to repeat that motion twice and then I do something with that block of text and you try it and it works and it's it's an it's an amazing feeling to <laughs> to really get down that that motion that helps you move the cursor around the screen without touching the mouse it just it's incredibly fast and it's very satisfying <laughs> um, but you get this this grammar that helps you to build like I said it, it's it's like a short scripting language where you're essentially you're almost writing code for Vim to edit the text. Uh, anyone familiar with Ed, the text editor Ed, uh, will be very familiar with kind of that, that feedback is you're, you're writing code to edit text, but in Vim you're doing it live. It's, it's really something. If you, I spent a lot of time messing around in Vim without knowing any grammar, and I had a lot of fun in it, but it wasn't until I learned the grammar that I really, really elevated my, uh, my abilities with Vim. Uh, Vim, that's obviously goes without saying, Vim is everywhere. It is very ubiquitous. Uh, I think the most recent version or most recent release of several distros, they abandoned Vim in favor of Pico, uh, which, you know, rip and pepperoni. Um, Pico is <laughs> Vim versus Emacs, and then it's like Pico. <laughs> Don't, Pico is a dumb text editor. It's, uh, it uses some key functions key chords in replacement of you know menu options um, and it is pretty accessible but you know if you're a professional you're not looking for accessible if you're a professional you're looking for the best tool that you can get that saves you the most time and gets you the most work done for the fewest keystrokes so Vim is everywhere and if you if you're never going to use Vim uh, if, you, if you refuse to use Vim <laughs> I would still learn the basics, you know, learn how to quit, learn how to edit text, you know, move the cursor around, learn how to save that, the absolute basic, because you will at some point find yourself in, in that trapped in Vim, <laughs> you know, that, that meme, uh, you will be trapped in Vim one day and you will have to figure out how to get out of it <laughs> or uh, do the walk of shame and find someone who actually knows what they're doing. <laughs> But Vim is everywhere, so it, it's a good thing to learn. It's like learning how to drive a stick shift. You, know, you might find yourself in need of this at some point. So it's just good to have. Vim is instantly customizable. And I say instantly because you can learn so much, or I'm sorry, you can learn so little and then start customizing Vim. Um, Vim lets you do amazing stuff. Uh, this is buffer traversing cross-modal recursive macros. So I don't know if you've ever found yourself in this situation, but you might have two buffers or two files open and you say, well, I'm in here and I need to go down, down, uh, select this, copy it, and then flip over to that screen and then paste it and then change the end of it and go back and then go down to the next line. And if you do that in Vim, congratulations, you just made a macro. Like, all you have to do is hit QQ, record all of that, moving from file to file, grabbing this section, moving it over there, adding some stuff to the end, going back to the previous file, and then going down to the next line to like, it's like you're cocking the gun for the next round. You're going to the next line so that it's ready to do those same functions over and over again. And you've already done it. Like, you, you've just built the macro. By just using Vim, you're inputting into a buffer where you can basically do whatever you just did as efficiently or inefficiently as possible <laughs> you can repeat that over and over and over and over and over and you can even play that back and record it into a, a bit of vim script so that it becomes a function that you can always call so even if you're just like fiddling around with the file and you're like let me move this here let me move that over there no that kind of failed undo undo let's go back undo that uh, try it again no that failed go back undo undo you know, no matter how long and bad <laughs> your, it, how inefficient your command is, if you do that, you can play it back. And it plays it back instantly, or more or less instantly. So it's very, very fast, uh, very, very quick to start customizing. Live key remaps, uh, really any form of user input. That's just, I can take, uh, you know, when I press A, I can make A, kick off a function and if I'm typing in the computer I'm typing in input mode I can make it so that when I type a certain thing it kicks off another function when I type JK in rapid succession it kicks off a function that gets me out of that mode 
So pretty much anything you type into Vim, you can customize at any point. If, if, even if you open up a command window, you open up a command section, you can, you can script that, all of it. It's kind of mind boggling. Um, so macros, registers, command histories, functions. So this is the thing is that if you start building something uh, into a macro, you are essentially, you know, you're scripting basically, you're, you're, you're writing code with Vim. You are sending keystrokes into Vim. You build that into a macro, that turns into a register, and uh, that goes into a register, and your command his or your registers are references to command histories, and all of that are functions. It's it's almost like a it's almost like complete integration. It's it's unbelievable, and Emacs does this too. It's it's just it's it it's basically its own operating system, but it is your own uh, it's your own text editing operating system. So, literally do ETL live semi manually. This was a job I had uh, for a while, uh, where I would get, you know, e ETL is uh, extract transform load. So you extract data from something, um, and that's u that was usually you know a hundred meg CSV file or a uh, uh, you know a gigabyte log file or something like that, something ridiculous, or a bunch of HTML. Who knows? You get the data. You, or you extract the data, you work with that data, you massage it so that it's only the data points that you want, you transform it into something that is loadable into the next application, and then you perform the load function. So doing this text modification where, um, I think the closest thing I could call it is maybe refactoring. If you're refactoring code, you basically do that with data for any ETL process. And I was doing all of that live in Vim, you know, stuff where you would write a short Perl script or a program to grab data out, do something with it, or queue it up, and then dump it out after you've finished programming it. I just open the file in Vim and then just do, 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 you know, fart around with it until I get it to where I want, and then end the recording, and then replay it 10,000 times, and I'm done. And it's, it's crazy. <laughs> I don't know uh, another way to put it. it. It's extremely powerful and it's extremely intuitive. Um, so the register integration was one of my favorite things about Vim. Uh, when you perform, y you can you can save sections of text into these registers, which are uh, basically little clipboards. You have a clipboard for every button on your key keyboard. Uh, pretty much every button, I might be wrong about that. Uh, but the point is, you if you record a macro, it goes into a register. If you record a section of data, it goes into a register. Uh, if you execute a command, it goes into a section of the register, which means whatever you type, you don't necessarily have to retype. You know, that, that's filling up your registers so that for your intent, uh, with the intention of you recalling that later. So it's, it's, it's excellent. Playing around with registers and learning more about registers will definitely up your Vim game. Infinite branching and undo files. This is, I know I've just talked a lot about how great Vim is, but this is probably my favorite feature, really. Infinite branching and undo files. So if you've been working on a file, <laughs> you can revert the file to 10,000 seconds ago. And you undo space 10,000, I think it's 10,000 seconds or 10,000 S or something like that. And it'll revert the file back to every keystroke you press is putting into the script script that you're creating. Uh, and it's it's all being saved and the it's all being time stamped, which is incredible. Um, so you're able to do stuff like revert this file to 325 AM, August 12th, 2014. And Vim will go, sure all the way back. And then if you want, you can press control R and redo almost every keystroke or every complete action that you perform on that file up until today. So that's extremely powerful, even to the point where if you, uh, and I say branching undo files, is if you, you, you do something and then you undo back to here and you do something different, well you can still undo back to this branch. So you can undo stuff that you undid, if that makes sense. So 
that is a tremendous feature really really incredible and again this is stuff you it makes your life easier because you can step back and say what you know if you mess up something in a file you can step backwards and go where w where did this file break you know when did this stop working and undo undo save try it undo 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 save try it you know especially if someone's like messing with you with like unicode edits and characters and stuff like that it'll help you to detect really really difficult to find bugs by just being able to step backwards uh, command mode i kind of covered that a little bit earlier it's extremely fast super featured uh, and has a low barrier of entry to get started you i don't know a quarter of the things you can do in command mode there's so much available uh, it's you know you can spend a lot of time in the command mode help menu just reading and going, wow, I had no idea you could do that. So this is still great stuff. So we're still in Vim plugins. So Vim added a feature a while back called Vim script that let you basically build a, you know, I, I've said that it's a bit of a scripting language for text editing. Well, this one allowed you to save stuff into memory and do much more with, with Vim. So people started creating plugins. They wanted to make uh, extend the grammar of Vim to include uh, support for different languages. Uh, basically, you know, if anyone was like, "Hey, I wish, I wish Vim could do this," and that's not a normal feature, then you can write something, uh, write a plugin, and add it yourself. Now, it is with Vim script, script, and Vim script is a little weird, but it does work. And there's lots of people out there making plugins for it because lots of people love this text editor. And when new stuff comes up that they can't find, Vim doing it easily or perhaps the way that Vim does it is a little bit obtuse. They use plugins to make it faster, faster, faster. It's great. There's a, a great plugin universe for Vim. Um, they vary from simple and lightweight grammar extenders to heavy and powerful data processors. Like I said, I've, do, I've done uh, 100 meg CSV files in Vim. Just take, uh, you know, take entire sections of the code and drop it down or, or of the CSV file and move it around. Uh, go to those files and then skip to the next one and then grab it and pull it back up so that it's under that one so that everything's resorted. All of this stuff is all, and it's all pipeable through Linux. So you can resort all these files. You can do pretty much anything you want to these files. It's unbelievable. So, and plugins uh, enable a lot of that. And uh, unfortunately, this is a, a love letter with a sad ending. It's, it's a little less sad now that I've found NeoVim, but uh, we'll, we'll get into that later. So those are the Vim features. So now the Vim failures. Plugins. They're terrible. <laughs> They're poorly written. <laughs> they can infringe on other plugins and they can make Vim slow, which is the, the cardinal sin. Uh, plugins are great if they're well written, if they're lightweight, uh, if they are written respectfully uh, and correctly. This means that if you just go adding plugins willy-nilly, uh, these are all kind of third-party plugins, so they're not officially approved or anything like that. You can make Vim super slow. Um, Vim is, at the time of this, and I think shortly after, single-threaded. I think they might have changed that. We'll get into that. Um, but plugins can be a big bugbear for for your Vim instance, for your for your IDE, of using Vim as an IDE, which which it is not, uh, but people just kind of they try to make it an IDE. Um, <laughs> that's the other thing is that adding plugins is in Vim is so difficult that they wrote plugins for adding plugins, which is uh, a neat solution, but not an indicator of of great intuitive software. It's not not a great design thing. Um, another failure, <laughs> infinite branching undo files. This is technically bad. <laughs> it's convenient, but it's not correct. And like I said, the undo files are my favorite feature of Vim. Uh, they've saved my rear end a lot, but they're not the right way to handle things. Uh, they're binaries, which are subject to corruption, file system problems. You know, if you spend a lot of time relying on that undo file and you open it up, and that undo file doesn't quite work, or it's corrupt, or it's a strange size, um, you get this pit in your stomach. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
and I've definitely been there and it's not the right way to do things you know if you're messing around yeah infinite undo is great but you should be using a version control system you should be using it, it lets you get lazy pretty much um, and the binary thing you'll start to rely on these files a lot and they are just binaries and they are subject to corruption and if they get corrupt you're out of luck you get no you get nothing um, and they can be multi-gig files which causes other problems um, this is part of the things like people set up vim and then they're like oh well i want this plugin and i want that plugin and i want to add this and i want to do that and i'm going to do lots of work with it and then things start slowing down and they start breaking and they're not sure what's going on and some plugin is conf conflicting or the file is too large for some other plugin that's trying to read the entire file rather than just deal with it in a frame buffer set um, weird stuff starts happening uh, so you know d plugins are great <laughs> but dial them back you know keep it simple to start out with uh, this is more of a user error copying someone else's vimrc if you copy someone else's vimrc you're not going to learn vanilla vim and i always recommend learning the vanilla version first before you start um, adding new stuff to it there is one exception to that in emacs but you'll we'll get to that later um, fan features and official limitations this is a um, this is like a, a design perspective thing so vim is is not an ide and brahm mulnar will till the day he dies i'm sure say vim is not an ide it is not made to do that and i can totally respect that as a, as a developer you need to know what a project is you you want to be respectful of uh, project creep or mission creep where people want to start making your widget do everything well why isn't this widget uh, 30 pounds well i think other people would like it to be lighter well why isn't it 25 pounds like that's not really what it's for man but fan features people start building vim you know they like vim they like working in vim so they're like well why why isn't vim an ide so they start extending features they start building plugins they start building infrastructure and things start getting weighed down because vim is single threaded um, the official limitations you know brahm is very has been very vocal about what vim is and what vim isn't and again i respect that but if the entirety of your user base is saying, or you know, 90% of your user base is saying, we want this feature, and you're like, no, you know, I will look down and say, no. <laughs> Again, I, I respect the flex. Technically, that's better software, but if people want it, and they're going to do bad stuff like writing bad plugins or doing things that Vim doesn't do very well, they're going to build that into it, and then other people are going to have a bad experience. Um, Vim, I think it's multi-threaded at this point. There's a there's a whole bit about this. Um, that's something. So let me come back to that a little bit. Uh, shell. When I was working heavily in Vim, uh, I really wanted to be able to work. I was doing a lot of work in Python at that point. So Python has a uh, an interactive shell, and I would use Tmux to multiplex my terminal so that I could do Vim and then do a shell, and then I used my keyboard to kind of connect the two and a whole bunch of hacks to make the make the, um, the Tmux and Vim clipboards be connected. I have a YouTube video on that. Uh, but if Vim could just have a shell in it, just a shell, just get the input, uh, get the output of it, put it into a buffer where you can text edit and select and do all your Vimmy goodness in that shell, you know, truly do it. I feel like that would have taken care of so much. Um, but the answer was no. The answer was no. So along came NeoVim. And NeoVim is a uh, almost a complete rewrite of Vim. It's gotten, totally check it out. I don't even recommend you start with Vim at this point. Uh, go straight to NeoVim. Um, I don't want to eat my words on that. Uh, probably start with Vim and then test with NeoVim. It should be an easy transition. Uh, but NeoVim was a project that was created with the intention of filling these holes that Vim has. And it has done a good job so far. Um, but the point is, there are holes. You know, uh, there's, you know, it's just the, the, the market opportunity. 
there's an unserviced section of the market, people who want Vim to do this stuff. And the people who are writing Vim now say, no. Okay, well, we'll just make our own Vim. <laughs> and they did. And that's not an indicator of people being happy with how things are going. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, it's I, I just got back into it. Uh, I'm still learning more about NeoVim, but everything I've seen so far uh, just had my jaw on the floor, really. So maybe start out with Vim, uh, but then transition to NeoVim as quickly as you can. Ergonomics. Uh, the ergonomics are not great in Vim, but for this older software, there wasn't a lot of respect for what people might do if they started typing, you know, for 10 hours a day, every day. Uh, <laughs> that wasn't even in their minds. So this is something that is uh, has come up Obviously, I'm pretty focused on ergonomics, so that's it is what it is. Uh, escape uh, in Vim, in order to change modes, most people just press escape. That's the standard key press. Don't press escape. Uh, remap JK or FD to be to exit insert mode. I'm typing stuff normally. I hit JK, and I'm back in normal mode. Um, Control C will also get you out of input insert mode. Uh, as will control right square bracket. So don't use escape, please don't. Do the JK, learn this Learn this muscle memory. Uh, I might recommend KJ or FD, because if you accidentally end an email in another program with JK, um, it doesn't throw people off. <laughs> they just wonder why you pressed FD. Uh, but if you end it with JK, they wonder if you're just kidding. So <laughs> if I had it to do over again, I would probably do FD. Um, all of that said, you might not run into these issues. So you really might be okay with, with just no, using normal Vim, uh, doing a few things, you know, not really spending hours and hours a day in it, but you'll still get all these features. You, know, you might not run into these limitations. So keep that in mind, you know, all of these failures that I've noted, you might not even experience them. So just keep that in mind. Yeah, yeah, that's technically most of these are features. Like, like I said, it's a designed feature. It's a design decision that was made for Vim was we're not going to do this. Again, totally respect it. But it's worth noting that it could do more and it, people want it to do more. Um, so that's Vim. Let's close that out. Emacs. Features. Help. Emacs is the closest to self-documenting software that I've ever seen. Um, you can just read in Emacs. And, and when people add new stuff, as long as they're observing the style guide, it's very easy to write uh, a blurb at the front of it that explains what, what X is doing and what Y is doing and how this, uh, this feature works, is, is meant to work, and what the limitations are. Uh, it's extremely verbose. <laughs> It's actually almost too verbose, uh, much like uh, uh, much like just getting into Linux. Uh, you might not even know what you're reading. So if you don't know what you're reading, you're not going to be very helped by the help. Uh, but it does have a tutorial. You know, you'll learn that stuff as you go along. It's it's slower. It's a slower transition to learn Emacs than it is to learn Vim. Uh, the help feature also allows you to check keys, functions, and and all dynamically updates to dynamically update all dynamic updates to customizations. Uh, there. So uh, every key I press in Emacs, and I am in Emacs right now, every key I press points to a function. And if I want, I can press help, and then K for key stroke, and then press a key, or a combination of keys that executes a function. And I'll get a help window that pops up and says, hey, this is what this keystroke is. This is what this keystroke does. This is what the reference to this keystroke is. Here's the source code for this keystroke if you want to read the function that it's activating yourself. And if I were to go in and add another layer of software, say, take this keystroke and, or take this function and map it to a different keystroke, and I do the same thing, it will update, uh, I don't know, I guess re reverse update. It'll tell me that this function is now bound to this new keystroke. Uh, so there's no you can't really tweak it so that you get lost. 
essentially. Yeah, it's very valuable because you can customize Emacs a lot. Um, Lisp. Learn a Lisp, please. <laughs> please, for my sake, learn a Lisp. It will bend your brain into very interesting shapes and you will be a better programmer for it. I don't even quite understand why uh, you would be better, but <laughs> it's once you grok Lisp, you understand so much more about programming. Um, the other things is learning a homoiconic language uh, where code is text and text, code is data and data is code, they're the same things. Learning that just makes it just takes like scales fall from your eyes. It's unbelievable. Now I'm not classically trained. Like I said, I'm an autodidact. Uh, I taught all myself, taught myself all this stuff. So I didn't learn. I don't have really a classical training, but learning this just really changed the way that I think about programming. It improved my programming for all languages that I know. That's really, it really simplifies things in your head. Uh, recursion. If you if you haven't learned recursion, recursion is um, well, it's a lot like recursion. Um, but it's learning that is another mind bend that is very helpful for you to learn. Lisp is just, I, I've, I've said this before in some of my vlogs, it's Lisp is just sublime and I don't have anything, any other word to describe what Lisp is. Um, learning functional programming is extremely helpful because it, it reduces the mutable code that you have set. Um, it's, I, I can't, I don't even know how to describe it more. Learn a Lisp. Uh, learn functional programming. Uh, learn something that's homoiconic and recursive. It's not super optimized in other languages, but it is human optimized. So you, the programmer, have an easier time looking at code and understanding what it does. Uh, it also gives you, usually gives you fewer lines of code, and it makes your code less mutable, which means when you have bugs, you have less code to look at uh, to, to discover those bugs or find where they are. And it is so simple. It is so elegantly simple. And this is actually the only, okay, um, what is it? Inline, yeah, inline maps. This is the only time, I, only image I have in here because it is totally perfect. <laughs> the only XKCD, it is so simple. It is, this is very accurate. Please just, please learn it. Please learn it. Uh, and then when you learn it, and you, you're all excited, and I am pretty excited, so take this with a, a, a slight grain of salt, but now your text editor does all that cool stuff. You know, now you get to do all that, rather than being in Vim, and you're like, oh, I'll just learn some Vim script, and you're like, but why would you, that syntax isn't, like, it, that doesn't even make sense, like logically it doesn't make sense, why would you have to, and you're just like, why? And, and then you learn the lisp, and you're just like, I, you know, it's a, it's an infamous rich hickey. I think it's a reference to something older, but it's like you've seen it. You've seen all the syntax. The syntax fits on one page. Like you've learned it. Ta-da! You're done. It just means that you're you're you mess around less with syntax. Please, please learn a Lisp. I'm gonna try to get off of this before this becomes a Lisp love letter. Um, speed. Emacs features a lot of speed because this is what I was talking about, travel time basically. The distance between you and the function you want is as short as a full-size keyboard can accommodate. So basically every func every key on a full-size keyboard, which of which I don't ha actually have right now, but every key on there becomes a function. And then when you start cording by holding down control or by pressing control X beforehand, all of these functions are just all over the keyboard. And if you have a brain for it, uh, because it does, it does take different people, uh, if you have a brain for it, you can memorize all of these very obtuse commands and access them basically as quickly as possible on a uh, on a keyboard or on a full size keyboard. Hang on, almost done. Um, on a full size keyboard. So there there are caveats to that, which we'll get into soon, but that is. Speed is speed is king. Like I've said, it's very important, and you get addicted to the speed. Uh, you don't have these uh, menu keys that you have to menus that you have to navigate through. Uh, support libraries, 
plugins uh, because Emacs is so extensible and, and, and likes you to add stuff to it, there's a lot of people who have added a lot of stuff to it. Um, there was a, uh, a video, I think it's called Writing a Spotify Client in Emacs in 15, or for Emacs in 15 minutes. That's the one that, that's the video that really just blew my mind is because all of this stuff, you know, like I said with Vim, you open up the terminal editor, uh, terminal multiplexer, and you have Vim up here, and you have Python down here, and then you, you link things back on the back end so that this connects to down there, and then you get feedback from here back to here, and you have to hack all this stuff together and use a lot of glue to fit it together. In Emacs, it's just all in Emacs, all of it. And you're, it's hard to, to think about once you actually realize it, but it, it's all right there. And that video really crystallized it for me. Um, there's a lot of extens extensibility in it now. It does start to get kind of heavy in some directions, but you'll, you'll, you'll appreciate it for what it is. Um, it's very customizable once you know what you're doing. Uh, like I said, once you get into Vim and you start you know, messing around where you kind of figure out how to operate Vim mostly, and you can kind of figure out how to edit text, you can start building macros. You know, even if they're poorly built, it'll still be quick, and you can start building them. With Emacs, there's a higher barrier to entry. You need to understand more of, you need to understand Emacs before you can start really building good stuff for Emacs. Um, that's just, you know, learning curve stuff. Uh, you'll, you'll catch on. It took me, like I said, it took me a while to make that transition, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, it's worth it. Org mode, if you haven't heard about org mode, um, you should. <laughs> There's a, uh, a Google talk uh, on org mode. All right, so I had no idea how long that was going. <laughs> um, I'll try to speed it up a little bit. I'm almost done. Org mode. Uh, org mode is what, uh, learn about org mode, you know, just, just look at what you can do in it. I use it, it it's over here. Uh, I use it just for personal management. I use it for business management. I use the, the, the text-based spreadsheets uh, to, to check my expenses and track business stuff. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And it's all in text, which is a medium I prefer. So you know, it's, it, it all, again, it's all integrated into Emacs. So that integration is the really is the, the powerful feature so totally look up org mode there are vim versions of org mode that are getting better so keep that in mind too failures slow to start like I said um, you have to know a lot more about Emacs in order to start doing pretty much anything in Emacs uh, it's an extremely difficult I, I say this as a very smart person who likes to get into this weird obtuse you know anything that's kind of weird and difficult I kind of like learning it Emacs took me a long time um, and it might have been because I was breaking previous par paradigms you know in my head uh, but it took me a long time so it's totally worth it but you know get in for the long run <sighs> shortcuts almost make it worse so if you're learning Emacs and you want to take those shortcuts, uh, like Space Max or Doom, um, they make it easier to get started quickly. It's like a quick start, but when you take that path of the quick start, you're not going to get the complete knowledge set that you need to actually grow from that. You, you hit kind of a dead end, and then you have to back up and then learn the basics in order to learn that expanded knowledge set so that you actually understand your text editor. Because if you don't understand it, you're just, uh, you know, you, you hit the limit uh, as quickly as you finish learning the tool, or as quickly as you finish learning the quick start utility. So as, as much as everyone says it, and as annoying as it is, do the tutorial and then do it again. Uh, I don't like Emacs's keystrokes, uh, normal, vanilla out of the box keystrokes I think they're bad I, in fact I know they're bad and you shouldn't use them however before you change them you should learn at least the basic ones uh, the simple ones because you will at some point you know even if you no matter how much you build stuff on top of Emacs to make it easier you will eventually find yourself in that Emacs fundamental mode and 
if you don't know how to get out of it, <laughs> you're stuck. So learn it. Um, do the tutorial, and then do it again, and then keep doing it. Okay. Um, I said this before. It requires a high minimum level of knowledge to start building functions and features and tools, so that you can get anything like anything like you get with Vim almost immediately. Uh, the ergonomics, you knew this was coming. Uh, you are stretching the limits of the keyboard. You run into this limit of how many keystrokes you get, and then you're just, like, they just started layering stuff on top of the keyboard. Like, well, you press, this button is a function. Like, okay, well, we filled up all the buttons. Okay, well, what if you press Control X, and then you press a button? Then it's a new layer of functions. So like, okay, well, we filled those up too. Like, okay, what if you press Control X, Control C, Control X, and then you press a button. And they're like, okay, we can do that. I was like, okay, what if you press Control X four times and then Control A three times, and then <laughs> you're just like, chill out. Um, the, you know, Meta Butterfly is a another XKCD that probably deserves to be here, but it's just it's super weird. Uh, the the type of cording that's required in order to just operate Emacs normally. So it's definitely a thing. Uh, Emacs Pinky is definitely a thing. Richard Stallman's RSI is definitely a thing. Um, don't get an RSI. Don't develop pain just because these ergonomics are bad in Emacs. So work around it. You'll see what I do later. Um, evils, modal, magic. Uh, evil is uh, adding modal editing. Uh, there's other systems that do it too, uh, but Adding modal editing into Emacs makes things infinitely better. You should not use the Emacs standard key chords. Do not. You know, learn them, use them a couple times. Uh, use them enough that you, you'll remember them for when you get stuck, but avoid them, avoid them, avoid them. And uh, this space reserved for future complaints. It's, uh, eventually, we're going to, I'm going to run into more problems. Uh, you know, if anyone who's used a piece of software for long enough uh, has developed plenty of gripes. Uh, some of them are probably not ones that will be experienced by tons of people. And this is where Vim's failures are a bit more expansive for me because I've been using them and I ran into those. I haven't yet run into very many of Emacs's problems. So just keep this uh, a grain of salt here. I'll, I'll learn more. And sometimes I do wish it was single threaded. When it is multi-threading, it is doing stuff in the background that is a feature, not a bug. There's lots of stuff, power available in that. There's lots of hooks you can get into to make your own uh, functions that run on time systems. But sometimes it lags and I'm like, what are you doing? Why are you lagging? What are you thinking about right now, computer? <laughs> Emacs, what are you doing right now? I don't know what you're doing, but I want you to do this right now. And that's something that's it's a little bit of purity in in Vim when when you're in there and it's being fast and it's it's only doing one thing and you you know that it's only doing one thing so that's pretty much it for the Emacs miss recommendations IDK lol <laughs> learn both um, Emacs is much harder to learn I would learn Vim quick uh, get a quick start guide start messing around with it Vim I think has a tutorial I'm pretty sure it does I learned it a long time ago uh, so I, I don't think I played around with it, um, but Emacs is definitely worth messing around with. The Lisp, you should learn a Lisp, though. That's, that, that, I'm going to say that's required. Um, Vim is light, quick, and everywhere. And Emacs is heavy, powerful, and extensible. They are, this is, this is submachine gun versus main battle rifle. They're, it's potato and tomato. They're not the same thing. They're not trying to do the same thing. Don't try to make them do the same thing. Don't force the square peg into the round hole. Uh, just keep in mind that these are they're different tools. They do different things. And a lot of that Vim script, a lot of those Vim plugins are attempts to make Vim into Emacs. And like I said, Emacs is an excellent uh, <laughs> Emacs is an excellent operating system lacking only a good text editor. <laughs> the help on both is, yeah, see, there we go. The help on both is excellent. Uh, that is by far the, the probably the greatest feature, aside from the undo files. That's that's awesome. Um, expose yourself to random tips on social media. Uh, follow Vim tips. Follow Emacs tips on social media. 
uh, go to Reddit as much as I, I dislike Reddit and just kind of hop on there every once in a while, see what's up, uh, watch videos on YouTube that talk about it, with, especially with Vim, someone will always, you know, no matter how remedial, like if you watch a video called how to exit Vim and there's like five ways to exit Vim, you'll still watch it. You'll be like, I know all of these things. And then at the end, he'll be like, and then of course do this in order to, uh, you know, do something you've never even thought of before and never even were exposed to. So you'll always, there's always more to learn, always more to learn. And um, opening the context that you receive that information in will definitely expand your knowledge of the system and improve it. Um, what do I use? Emacs with evil modal, modal editing. Emacs evil escape, which lets me use JK to escape the, uh, the modal insert mode and leader keys where I press space and then I press a key to open up something like this Helm uh, fuzzy finder for all of these functions that I don't really use that often. Um, my leader is space. I highly recommend space as a leader. I think, and in Vim as well, space as the leader. I think it's normally comma, uh, which is all right, but space is way more accessible and the thumbs are always faster. I use, I definitely use Emacs with all these settings and I definitely use Emacs org mode. Uh, and yes, I do still use Vim. Uh, I mostly use it on remote file systems and I mostly use it for quick file editing. I don't think there's ever going to be a time that I'm in a terminal and I see a file and I don't just type Vim space the file. Uh, and it, because it, it's just quick. If I have that file in Emacs, I can do a lot more with it. I can access it from different places. Uh, there's a lot that's really fleshed out in Emacs, the, the age of Emacs, uh, the, I'm sorry, the maturity of Emacs really shines through. Um, but NeoVim might make some of that more, the heavier stuff in Emacs. It might give that stuff a run for its money. Uh, definitely check out NeoVim. So I hope that's everything. Uh, that's the end of the talk pretty much. Uh, I appreciate you sticking with me. I'm gonna see if I can edit this together. and. Uh, if you have any other questions, uh, ask them, I guess.